Okay, today we are going to be talking with Elsa and Arya about compartmentalization. And I think that compartmentalization, I've always thought that it's like one of these major aspects of kind of psychopathy, the experience. I just naturally assume that everybody who's a psychopath experiences it, but I think normal people experience it too. So I guess we're going to talk about some of the differences uh, between that and why each group would want to compartmentalize. And the reason why I was kind of thinking about this is Arya has been asking me recently, you know, like, why do you think we compartmentalize? Because especially at the beginning of our relationship, I would call her sometimes or she called me and it would be like uh, almost talking to a different person. And I think this is, uh, she's had past relationships too, say a similar thing where uh, she's compartmentalizing to such a degree in her life that if you catch her in one moment, it's going to be almost a different person than if you're talking to her in another moment. And I, I think that's probably a pretty common experience when when you're dealing with uh, psychopaths, even my own family, you know, will say things like I, that I will get in certain moods, for instance, like uh, it will be scorched earth mood. And then when that happens, you know, there's like nothing that I won't do. To, and just for things like board games or something, you know, Monopoly. And I, if I get in a scorched earth mood or something, something bad happens, I'm like, okay, you're all going down or whatever. Uh, and I don't think they think that I'm like that all the time. So like, what is it about me and my ability to compartmentalize? And then what does that kind of say about other people too, and their sense of identity and our sense of identity? You want to speak a little bit about your experiences first, Arya? Yeah. So when we started talking about compartmentalizing, it came to my mind because I actually thought I'm not as good at it as I used to be. And one of my best friends. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Can you maybe yeah. just like give like a definition on how you define um, that whole topic? Like the, uh, uh, that like, yeah, I don't know what you understand about that so that there is no mm -hmm. misunderstanding, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I did, I was uh, always very good at labeling my friends, right? And I didn't intermingle them either, right? I had one friend that I referred to as my music friend, right? He was like always giving me new albums, new artists, new songs to listen to. And I didn't intermingle him with other friends of mine. In fact, I had another friend that I refer referred to as my true crime friend. And her and I, you know, we listened to podcasts together, documentaries, that kind of thing. And one day she told me, you know, it actually offends me that you call me your true crime friend. You know, I have a name. <laughs> you can refer to me as my name and I am your friend, uh, not just your uh, outlet for your true crime uh, obsessions, uh, things like that. But the reason I thought about this was about two weeks ago, one of my best friends told me uh, he was talking to my ex and <clears throat> they were both commenting on how there were some times that when I'm speaking to them, they, I'm speaking to them in a way that they know I am their friend, right? And I'm relating to them as their friend, their best friend even. And I'm sweet and kind and considerate. And then other times, you know, he's like, I will text you and you'll maybe just say something, you know, just curt, right? Sure. Okay. Yes. No, I don't think so. You know, these kind of curt responses. And he was like, and I'll get off the phone and think like, hey, that was kind of like a waste of my time, right? To talk to her while she's like this. And he was just commenting on it because um, I hadn't done it to him in a long time until that week. Uh, he had a personal crisis and was texting me about it. And I was like, well, I don't know what you should do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's why it comes to mind. So in terms of like a definition, I mean, the way that I use compartmentalize is kind of like, okay, uh, let's say, well, I think our, we have another friend who's, who's like very compartmentalized with his life. And it's basically like, and I have a cousin who's this way about food, uh, that she is, you know, she's now in her forties or whatever, and she's like a successful doctor, but she still buys those little like school trays that have the little ridges in the middle. So foods don't touch each other. You know, have you used those before Elsa? Um, yeah, I have not used it, but I know uh, what it is. Yeah, yeah. So uh, she'll still do that because she does not like foods to touch. 
uh, that, and I'm kind of like, well, you know, they're going to touch eventually, you know, like actually pretty quickly in your stomach or whatever. And she's a doctor. She understands all that, but she just doesn't want them to touch. And he's like that with like every aspect of his life, almost to the point where his friends kind of don't know about each other. And actually, there's a weird story about my dad uh, living in Europe. Uh, where he was like uh, there for my his uh, stepdad at the time uh, was there for military service, and so my dad was actually just sent to the the language. Uh, I think it actually was German, so German speaking uh, school. You know, even though he didn't speak German at first, and of course he's going to learn German when he's like four or five, six or whatever. And but he would never speak German in front of his parents even to the point where it was just kind of weird. Like they'd be going for a walk and people would be yelling at him like, hey, hey, friend. And he'd be like ignoring them and then kind of like walk a little bit behind and then like give him like a little furtive wave or something, you know. But he was like, he definitely wanted his German life to be very separate from his family life for whatever reason. And I think that you see that in kind of um, people who are a little bit more traumatized maybe tend to want to do that like I would guess that that was my dad at the time because he had just been living in a you know like a bad situation then when his mom remarried and then went to Germany then everything was fine and I think he probably just wanted it to stay fine you know and so he was like let's just not kind of mix and mingle things when we don't have to so I feel like people who are kind of like traumatized or people that are a little bit conflict avoidant uh, might tend to do kind of these compartmentalizing things what do you think about this Elsa? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, basically kind of the definition of uh, compartmentalization um, that you have like, like that you're, that you like feel some cognitive dissonance and then um, there are like some strategies uh, how people like deal with that. And I think one strategy is to uh, compartmentalize so that you just like, um, yeah, separate the different thoughts or feelings or whatever you're experiencing. So I think that makes sense for people that are traumatized to do that. So I think, uh, is it okay if I just read like a little bit of the text that you sent to me about compartmentalization? Um, yeah, sure, if you can read that. Yeah, so you said, uh, I assume with compartmentalization, aria means compartmentalization as a defense mechanism in which thoughts and feelings that seem to conflict or to be incompatible are isolated from each other to separate them as a way to deal with cognitive dissonance caused by inconsistent thoughts, feelings, behaviors, or other conflicting internal viewpoints. If that is the case, I had some thoughts on that about a year ago when you read The Self-Illusion, right? And you, yes. uh, <clears throat> you said you'll copy a part of that that you were writing to our mutual friend at the time. Do you want me to read that part too? Is that okay? Um, yes, you can read that. Yeah. So you say, so basically the brain constructs a model of the external world by making a coherent story of the things the person experiences, which kind of builds the self. The brain does this because we would be overwhelmed by the volume of information if we didn't have that mechanism and a lot more. However, there was one interesting part that said that, for example, we think we are generally successful in attaining our goals, but sometimes we fail, which is inconsistent with how we think of ourselves. So our brain tries to avoid the conflict and we kind of reinterpret our failure as success. The author, for example, said he thinks he is a good person, but sometimes he has bad thoughts about someone else. So he rationalizes his thoughts and tries to reframe the bad thoughts he has towards the other person just to maintain his valued sense of self. I have a quick question on this one. So I always kind of said, like, I always want to stay off my dad's radar because, and this is kind of like, uh, if you probably have never read this book, it's kind of a weird philosophy book, uh, but it's called Bonds That Make Us Free. I think I've written about it before on my blog. But he kind of says that like in these situations, let's say we have bad thoughts about someone. He says that a temptation is to not just try to kind of come in and be like, oh, so-and-so is not so bad, but that we'll actually just start thinking one way to resolve the conflict of uh, these bad thoughts you're having about someone is to think they're terrible. And that's actually what my dad always does. <laughs> There's been so many times <laughs> when he's done this with me and especially what my uh, brother, <laughs> Where he's just like, you know, my, he, oh, he'll say, you know, your brother is so sketchy. 
you know, you have to be careful. <laughs> and he's constantly like <laughs> vigilant against my brother for some reason. And it's so sad because my brother's just like this normie dude, <laughs> you know, he's just like works for the man in this like corporate environment or something. You know, he has all these kids. He's like, he's an adult now. He has like this very respectable life. But my dad just like does not see it or whatever. He just thinks like everybody in uh, uh, my dad's life uh, needs to be protected from my sketchy brother, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's probably from he had like issues with him in childhood, right? And was like, you know, the reason why I treat him this way is because he is a threat, you know? And, that, you know, he's just kept that belief about my brother all throughout his life. And it's so sad because you've never seen someone with like daddy issues like you've seen my brother. All he wants in his life is just for my dad to kind of accept and love him. And it's like <laughs> to watch these interactions <laughs> where you're just like, oh, man, you know, like who cares what he thinks? <laughs> you know, he, he's obviously just in some weird psychological K-hole, you know, like just forget about it. He's never going to like accept you or love you because long ago he sacrificed his good, you know, will towards you uh, to the like altar of cognitive dissonance where he felt badly about himself for treating his son so poorly all the time. And so he had to think that you're like a terrible person, you know, and that you're basically like, you know, baby Hitler. And so he's just doing the world a favor, you know, by like putting you down every chance he gets, you know, that's kind of like what's going on there. So I think sometimes people with this cognitive dissonance, maybe they self-reflect like the author of uh, uh, Curse of Self, uh, but maybe they, you know, they go the other way and they don't self-reflect at all and they just start seeing people in this tribalistic way of like villains and good people and, you know, we have to like attack the villains and we have to let support the good people a little bit. You have any yeah, thoughts on yeah, that? You're, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, so for cognitive dissonance, there is not only one way how people um, resolve that, for example, like one way is like that they try to rationalize that thought or that feeling, like kind of like, yeah, um, they think they were like a good person in general, and then they have bad thoughts about other people, and then they rationalize and say like, oh yeah, but this other person is really bad because he did like these bad things. So this is like another way. So there's not only one way to deal with uh, cognitive dissonance, but one way is also the compartmentalization and I think that can be like what I read about that topic, that can also go into a very like problematic direction. So that can cause real problems for people if they compartmentalize a lot. And I think, uh, yeah, when they have like real traumas and not like in day in like everyday life. So uh, what sort of, um, if, if you can like just tell us off the top of your head, like what sort of bad things happen from like over compartmentalization that you've read about? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I uh, still remember that. Uh, I, I think it's just like that they um, like really get like different, like, or, or have like, get like kind of like different people, uh, like until the point where they kind of like really separate like, yeah, they like their feelings and thoughts. Like I think like one example they had is that for example, they're like like a man who is like an asshole at work and who's like treating other people, uh, for example, women like really, really bad and like, I don't know, hitting them, whatever. But then he gets home to his family and then he's like a loving father for his daughter or something because he kind of separates like these thoughts or these feelings uh, so much that he can exist in like really two different ways and then that can get problematic i think yeah that actually kind of uh, reminds me of a situation maybe this is what's happening there is uh, and maybe aria can tell us this story there was a guy who uh, he murdered his family including his two little baby girls uh, because he was like having an affair and it's like, how do you justify doing this? You want to talk a little bit about this one? Do you remember the name? Yeah, I don't remember his name, but I don't remember. You're blanking. Yeah, so I'm there's blanking. An, a Netflix uh, show oh, about him. Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you can look it up. Uh, whatever his name is. 
uh, but the basics are, you know, he just had like kind of like these two families going on and just, I think the, the, you know, kind of like the cognitive dissonance, you know, like that, that the rub there between, you know, having like this family and the wife and he just could not kind of like resolve it. So he's like, I just need to eliminate the children and then I'll be free to kind of pursue this other life. But it's like, why did he get, you know, in this first relationship in the first place? You know, like, why did he get married? Why did he have the kids if he's not going to have them or something? I mean, some people, I think maybe this would be like one, another example of, uh, you know, you've compartmentalized too much. And now you're able to compartmentalize to the point where you're like, you know, choking your, your small children to death and like putting them in oil barrels, you know, to dispose yeah. of their bodies. That's a pretty bad one. So you kind of go on to say that um, about the self, you say that um, if you have these kind of bad thoughts about someone else and you think you're a good person, then you're going to rationalize the thoughts or try to reframe the bad thoughts towards the other person just to maintain your valued sense of self. But you go on to say, do you have a, a thought yeah, on that? Yeah. I actually just read this paper last night in which borderline personality disordered people compartmentalize really well as two, but they um, do something called grouping, right? So if they have a negative interaction with someone, uh, that person automatically gets thrown into the bad category, whatever bad means. And then there are people who are in the good category, which more or less means that they put up with the uh, bullshit of the borderline person and they're you know, susceptible to it. The bad people are the ones that um, force them to enforce their own boundaries, right? And enforce uh, their own reality on the borderline person. So therefore they are quote unquote bad. Yeah. And uh, I should probably say, you know, that my own dad, I think, I don't want to, you know, give him a diagnosis, but he seems to be, show symptoms of a personality disorder. And it does seem like there is a connection between compartmentalizing and personality disorders. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, do you, uh, do you want to just like kind of speak on, from your own personal behalf about like your own experience? Like do you compartmentalize in your life, Elsa? Um, I, I don't think that I really um, compartmentalize uh, a lot because I don't feel like I don't feel that like um, – I, I don't feel bad when I have, like, for example, like different uh, or contradicting thoughts about uh, people or whatever. So uh, I don't think I really do that. So, um, I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can see what you mean. Do you compartmentalize like with friends or with anything? You, you kind of don't do it because I guess there's kind of like this conflicting thoughts uh, but there's also kind of like different situations you might find yourself in. So like while you're working, oh, this is a, a good one for you because you're a scientist. I think that's like uh, the, I think also like one part of the notes that I sent you, um, like when you're not talking about compartmentalization as like, you know, defense mechanism or how to um, resolve a cognitive dissonance, I think then um, I do uh, compartmentalize a lot, kind of like that I that I'm really good at focusing on like different tasks and do not let other things like interfere with that. So if I'm at work, I can completely focus at work, and even though if I have I don't know like some um, arguments with my family or friends or whatever, I can just shut them out so I do not think about that because it's not bothering me so much that I um, yeah have to think about that and that I cannot do my work properly or something like that and also if I have like sometimes I have different friends and around these friends I'm also kind of different so because I know some friends they like me uh, kind of like me as this person and with other friends I'm kind of different because uh, they like them more so yeah I, I do that but I don't don't really define that as uh, compartmentalization. It's more like, yeah, I don't know how I define that, but not as compartmentalization. Yeah, it's interesting you say that <clears throat> because uh, this this friend that we have that like compartmentalizes so much, 
I mean, he is so kind of, uh, he's mostly conflict avoidant, I think, is what's happening. And it's so funny because we, we play music together, right? And he was, he kind of mentioned to me, he's like, out of the blue, there, there are two people in the group that are in our relationship. And he, he asked, you know, like, how strong do I think that relationship is? And I think his concern there in asking, you know, of course, he, he likes the people and he wants them, you know, to be happy and stuff. But I think somewhere in his mind, he's also thinking what happens when they, when, if they break up and then who has to get kicked out of the group, you know, because we're not going to, we're not going to have this conflict, you know, this like kind of like, you know, awkward, he hates awkwardness, you know, he hates any, any sort of conflict or whatever. So I think that is why he compartmentalizes so much. And I, I think it's interesting, like you can kind of see, we've like become better friends with him. Uh, and uh, we have been introduced to more aspects of his life. At first it was like super compartmentalized, you know? And now like, I think that his other friends are aware that we exist, you know, <laughs> as his kind of like other friends. So that's kind of like a, a big deal for him. But it's, it's kind of like what uh, Arthur, our mutual friend said, uh, remember we all, uh, for people listening, we were all in a, an extended van trip uh, up to the Pacific Northwest and over to Yellowstone together. So we had a bunch of time to talk about this. And I asked him, you know, what does he think about compartmentalization? He says, again, it's easier. You put some people in this, some in that category. If you're not sure, you act as if contact with them was more dangerous, problematic, unpleasant than it really is. And when you don't get later is loss and disappointment. Plus, you did it easily and quickly. Of course, you lose some options and possibilities, but everything comes at a cost, right? So you're just kind of like, uh, kind of uh, what he suggests is, seems to be kind of like what the borderline people do, which is you're like in a good category or you're a bad category or like, you know, even if you're like in an uncertain category, uh, then you're, you know, you kind of treat it as an unknown, you know, so which is an inherent risk. And that it's just kind of like an efficient way that our brain handles things is that we're just categorizing people constantly. And if you just compartmentalize, then you, it's just like more efficient because it's like, uh, you know, it's kind of like the technical difficulties I was having like this morning with the microphone. It's like, if you have one microphone, uh, that's simple, you know? And if you have five microphones and you're trying to get them to all interact or whatever, that's very complicated. What do you think about that, Elsa? Um, yeah, I think like what you're describing or what you just, yeah, I, I think, it, I think that's not really a uh, compartmentalization. I think, I mean, not in the term that, uh, psychology is using it. So I think that is something normal that everyone is doing that you're just like constantly like, because you have to kind of, yeah, you, you have to predict like things or your brain tries to predict every person you're meeting. So I think this is something very normal that everyone is doing. Um, I think like compartmentalization in the psychology term is more that you kind of um, have like this different categories where you put people, for example, or thoughts and they cannot, there's no way they can, you know, like interact these two categories. Um, but if you're like in everyday life, so if your brain, if you meet someone and you first uh, put the person in this category, then you can, your brain can still change that. For example, when you learn, like when you get to know the person. Yeah. So I don't think that this happens like in like compartmentalization, like the psychology term is used. So have you ever heard, I mean, can you think of like, what would be another term to kind of just describe this? Like just the brain simplification? Yeah, well, yeah I think let's just... Oh, go ahead, Elsa. No, you, you, you go on, you go on. I was thinking of this last night. I think another way that I would have described it for myself was more of a uh, less compartmentalizing and more of a fractured personality. Um, often it was... Uh, Often my friends and people that I was dating, you know, I used to be dating multiple people at once, right? They each satisfied um, a different part of my personality, um, kind of in this socially acceptable way, right? So I had some, 
I had one guy that I used to hang out with and kind of lightly date and uh, we went to movies together and that was exclusively what we did. Nothing else. Right. Or I had a girlfriend who was like a drinker. Right. So we partied together. That was like our thing. So for me, it was less about not wanting these people to intermingle. And of course I wouldn't because I'm dating multiple people at once, but um, it was more that it was just different facets of my personality uh, uh, acting out in the world with other people. So this is actually kind of what you said, Elsa, you know, continuing this uh, message that you sent to me. You're, you're saying that normal people are trying to resolve the cognitive dissonance to maintain your valued sense of self, right? They have the sense of self and even having this concrete sense of self is something that they value and they're trying to maintain. And you say, but actually it's several different selves that don't really fit together, but the brain creates an illusion that makes it seem like that. And then you say, I think the ego of psychopaths can't be hurt that easily. So they are not hurt by inconsistencies and don't mind if they have an inconsistent view of themselves or different selves. At least in my case, you say, I guess, I know that you say, I know that myself is kind of incoherent. Like, for example, I know I have double standards. Actually, it's more like triple or whatever comes after that quadruple. But in contrast to other people, I don't bother. I don't have to lie to myself to feel good. Anyway, these are kind of not finished thoughts. So maybe they are really incoherent. But I think that's, again, goes to your uh, position, which is that you don't mind the inconsistency in your own self. You, you feel like you are really just this kind of group of different selves and they don't have to be consistent. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, that's exactly what I, yeah, what I wanted to say with that, yeah. And, but you think this, this is kind of normal or do you think that it's more psychopaths are okay with this inconsistency and normal people aren't? And why do you think that is? Yeah, I think that's like because of the, like, yeah, of the ego and the uh, sense of self that, um, like, yeah, usually people, I, I think it's not like something that you consciously do, but it's more like, um, yeah that they can that they feel like some kind of tension if they have like inconsistent thoughts or feelings so the brain is kind of trying to work around that but i think for me the brain does or i don't feel like any tension so i there's no motivation for me to kind of try to fit it together and make like a like a whole picture out of that so i can live with that being inconsistent yeah yeah and you you even go on to say uh so maybe we'll try to post the link to this youtube video but i think people kind of underestimate maybe how much tension they're feeling in their life i i think that's why i like the story of my dad and my brother is that would you be willing to destroy a primary relationship in your life for the sake of your own cognitive dissonance for resolving that cognitive dissonance and the answer is yes we actually see it like all the time and actually i've heard other stories where people are like i'm just not ever going to speak to my sibling again because i think they stiffed me out of some insurance money you know like i actually because i'm a lawyer you know i hear these stories i feel like maybe more frequently than normal people do because you know that's something that i have been involved with is resolving some of these situations and you just like wonder, like, really, it's like a $5,000 swing or something. You know, it's a $10,000 disagreement. And that is going to be the reason why you're going to destroy this primary relationship. But you kind of suggest there's a YouTube video, you say, that says that cognitive dissonance can even make the person feel physically not well. So there is even a higher motivation to resolve that tension uh, by via compartmentalization. You know, I guess in this situation, just compartmentalizing somebody completely out of your life. And then you say, I never felt unwell when I felt cognitive dissonance. Not sure if feeling cognitive dissonance is something that people say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder if they do say that because maybe they're not aware of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like it's not only that they try to solve it with uh, compartmentalization, but also like with trying to uh, rationalize their thoughts or feelings or whatever. So I think they were like, I think uh, the guy in the video just at least listed like three different ways how people usually try to um, avoid that tension or to dissolve that tension. So if you don't do this, you know, how, how do you think, like, could you describe to us like how it feels for you to feel, uh, I guess you don't feel the cognitive dissonance, but like 
how do you even conceptualize yourself, I guess, if there's so many kind of different selves? Like, why is it that you do not feel cognitive dissonance? I mean, I'm not sure if like people in general, like feel it, like, you know, like a thought and they feel, okay, now I'm feeling that. I think it's more something that happens in like an unconscious way. Um, and since I do not know how they, uh, how, how they feel, I cannot really compare that. So I have no comparison. I, I don't know. Maybe I do feel the same and I just don't know that. So yeah, I, I don't know how, how I would describe that. Well, has anyone ever uh, told you or kind of asked you like, uh, has anyone kind of like brought it up to you? The fact that you are different people and kind of unabashedly, unapologetically different people. I mean, it's not that I'm different people, but like, I can have like, it's more like, you know, or like in daily life, for example, people usually if they, for example, say um, they do not like uh, big, like the, the really big like companies like Amazon and they do not want to support that. So they do not order anything on Amazon. And then they try to be consistent with that. And if then they order something on Amazon because they can only get it there, then they feel bad about that. And they're like, oh yeah. And they kind of feel the tension. But I don't like Amazon. I, I, I don't like that. And I actually don't want to support them. But then I do order things on Amazon, but I do not feel bad about that. It's, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I just don't feel bad about that. So I know that I do not like them and I do not want to support them, but I still do. And yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, kind of like that. This is funny. It reminds me, I have a friend who's vegan, but she's also a horse person. She owns a horse and she just uses leather products. She's just like, you know, there's, there's not other <laughs> vegan products out there. Like leather is just the thing that is used for saddles or for whatever else. And, you know, maybe people hearing this will be like, oh, no, there actually is. But she, she's the same thing with Amazon. She just canceled, you know, an Amazon membership and stuff. I was talking to her about kind of stock trading. I was going through like these lists of stocks that she might want to, you know, buy because she's just, you know, barely starting to kind of think about it. And I was like, well, there's a lot that you can invest in and, you know, gave her like this list, but it seemed like every, every stock I mentioned, she had like some opposition to, but it's like, you know, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes she's going to, you know, buy from Amazon. And sometimes she even, I think intentionally does not look at the ingredient list at a restaurant because she doesn't want, you know, the possibility that there might be some butter in there to, you know, like eliminate the possibility that she's going to be able to eat, you know, at one of these like social yeah. functions. Yeah. See, I would just like, I would look at the ingredients and I would see, oh, okay, there's butter in there, but yeah, whatever. I will still, I still want to eat it. So I will still eat it, even though it actually is inconsistent with my, yeah, like thoughts or with what I'm usually doing. Yeah, it's funny because she's she's totally rational about the horse thing. I mean, she'll she'll tell everybody, nope, I'm a vegan, but I do. And I think she she's pretty like you know flexible too about like shoes and other things because she's just kind of like you know this is the way it is or whatever. <laughs> but then yeah, these other kind of situations where she's like less. Uh, but just, I think also like kind of like uh, rationalizing it. So she says like, yeah. Um, I use leather leather products because all of that is made out of leather and there is no uh, alternative to that. So I think this is kind of a uh, rationalization. So I wouldn't need this excuse like, okay, but I do not have any other um, like opportunities so, or any other thing to do, any alternative. So yeah, I do not have to rationalize about that. So you know what I mean? What do you think is the relationship then between compartmentalization and rationalization? Like, and sometimes it, when we're, you know, in our conversation, it seems like it's an either or thing. Like you face cognitive dissonance and you can either go the route of compartmentalization, you know, and just kind of like, you know, stuff it under the rug, or you can go through the process of rationalization, which is where you yeah. distort either reality or your, your own beliefs or kind of change them, you know, manipulate them in order to be more consistent. Uh, but it, is there, is it really just either or, or what do you think is the relationship there? Yeah, I think maybe it's also like a kind of like a weird mixture between both of them. I think there's like the 
third thing that is kind of like ref like reframing or like changing the behavior um which is i yeah so i think there is like multiple ways how to um act on like these feelings of uh dissonance and but i'm not a psychologist so i don't know if it's either or thing or if you can also kind of if they can be mixed up and be like a combination of both so i'm not sure about that so this is a good kind of follow-up question to that. Uh, since you don't feel cognitive dissonance, do you ever change your own behavior uh, as a result? So like normal people, let's say, you know, uh, you know, my friend who's vegan, she finds out that her favorite, you know, cookies have butter in them. She might change her behavior and stop eating the cookies. You know, does this ever happen to you where you're like, okay, I have discovered there's some inconsistency. And so I'm going to change my behavior based on this discovery um well let me think about that um it's there's nothing that i can just like get immediately in my head um but maybe i will maybe I'll, i will find something i don't know i think probably i did because i mean there's things that are like obviously bad like i don't know eating un unhealthy food and then um you just like stop eating that but I'm not sure if I really do that because I feel like inconsistent. Yeah. I don't know if you do. <laughs> yeah. I, as you were wondering, I was like, you know, do I even have an example of my own self of doing this type of behavior? I'll tell you, uh, and this, this I kind of think, you know, maybe the, one of the reasons why we don't have cognitive dissonance is because you kind of suggested this in your, your message to me is that we don't think of the self as being like this, uh, you know, sacred kind of concept, you know, or like, you, you know, it's so valuable to us. Uh, I, think I think it's something that we think it's something that, or it's something that people feel, but not like consciously feeling. It's more like, a, yeah, something they do not even know that they're feeling that, you know, I mean. Yes, but do you, uh, yeah. Exactly. And do you think, though, that, like, how do you conceive of yourself? You know, do you think you conceive of it like a, a normal person would? Like what? Sorry, I didn't get that. The self, like your own sense of self or identity, you know? Yeah. What's with that? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> so like normal people, like we, you, you wrote in this message, normal people think of the, the self as being so valuable and like this kind of stable c concept of self. You know, I'm a good person. It's so valuable that they're going to go through all this effort and experience the cognitive dissonance and maybe even be incentivized to change. You know, like my friend, if she finds out her favorite brownies or favorite cookies have butter in them, she's going to stop eating them because her self is so important to her and her concept of self as being a uh, vegan it's funny do you ever uh, is this a meme too in uh, uh, where, where you're from where uh, they uh, people say that the funny thing about vegans is that they're always talking about their veganism <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you have a conversation without them being yeah. like well <laughs> me being vegan <laughs> yeah, well, as, a, yeah. as a vegan is that like uh, still a concept there it, yeah, it's also a concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, like, like we make fun of that too. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she definitely has like this sense of identity about it, right? But uh, do you, you know, do you have like that, uh, that same sense of kind of identity that you're, you're going to experience this cognitive dissonance? And if not, what does it feel like then? No, I mean, I, I don't have that. So I can, I know that I can like be different. So I can like, it will it wouldn't be it wouldn't matter to me so i can live as vegan like the one day and then the next day when i'm in a different situation and there's no one no person that is vegan anymore i can just be not vegan anymore and i wouldn't feel bad about that so um i i, I don't feel that so i do not like have like have that as my identity that they say like oh yeah i'm vegan and that's like kind of like a core thing of me so i can just change that like i don't know like i change a t-shirt something yeah i think the t-shirt example is a, a really good example I, I think this is like what uh normal people kind of don't understand is that uh we're not even you know because i think a complaint 
uh, maybe you've heard it before on like forums or whatever, you know, people who complain that they're victims of, of psychopaths who, or who want to say kind of bad things, you know, they're kind of like, they're inhuman, you know, they act in all these kind of like terrible ways and they're not even in, consistent about the way they act as if consistency was like this like valuable thing. But, you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages, I think. Uh, one, maybe you've had this experience if you can be vegan one day and not vegan the next, then it's really easy to change. And I think, you know, that's one thing that my therapist has mentioned. I think it's one thing that uh, Arya's therapist has mentioned too, is that we can be really influenced for good too. Uh, so another quick example, uh, I gained some weight, right, during coronavirus. And I went, to, uh, I went to my doctor's office for something unrelated, right? And they weighed me. And then I got like an email like a week later being like, your BMI is too high. You know, and, you know, my friends, you know, they'll be like, you're just muscular. And it is probably true that it's, uh, <laughs> it's not as unhealthy for me to be a particular weight. I had a friend who was like, well, how much does each of your breasts weigh? You know, you have to factor that in. <laughs> so I was like, you know, they're very sweet about it. But I was like, you know, I also can just be a little bit lighter. I don't have to, you know, be this particular weight. So they sent me all these like uh, oh, resources, you know, and you can now you qualify for like this health coach. So I have this health coach that I talk to and I think he's kind of like and I've, I've walked into this kind of blindly because they, they're like, he's not going to give you nutritional advice. He's not going to give you health advice at all. And what he kind of turns out to be is more like, I don't know, like kind of new agey, like a life coach. He's just like, well, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to? And I was like, I had no clue what to say. So I was like, drink more water. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, okay, sure. That's, that's your thing. So I was like, okay, I'm drinking more water now. And uh, it's been interesting because as he kind of feeds me, he's, I think he's been kind of leading me along to a place of like where now I'm doing uh, meditation and mindfulness things because, you know, why? Just because he told me, he's like, all right, and then I'll, I'll, we'll talk again in three weeks and then we'll ask, you know, I'll ask you, how have you been doing with meditation? You know, do you like it or not or something? And I must be like <laughs> one of his like most easygoing patients because I have almost no reluctance uh, to kind of make these life changes. You know, whatever he says, I'm like willing to try. Well, you because why not? You know, this is his job or whatever. He's probably good at his job. That's usually how I feel whenever people, you know, it's not like I'm like listening to, you know, somebody who's not a doctor about health advice, but if it's a doctor and it sounds like it's consistent with what I know uh, to be science, you know, and my own like my rational thinking, then I'll just do it. You know, I don't need to have kind of like all this extra proof. Definitely, I'm not going to be one of these people who's like waiting for the vaccination, you know, coronavirus vaccination, because it's like, you know, I'm willing to <laughs> kind of do these things, take these chances. And I think it's almost because there's like a lack of fear there, lack of fear about the unknown, lack of fear about like what this means about me, you know, uh, lack of fear about like how this is going to affect my sense of self and my sense of identity. And I think most people don't think of these types of things as being like a self identity issue. But I think that actually it has like a bigger role than they're aware of. You know, they, and this is kind of like why that book is titled, right? The Curse of Self, I think, is because there are all these downsides to self. Does that sound right? Um, yeah, that makes sense. So, um, I mean, I, you, you, you read the book. I bought the book and I didn't read the book. <laughs> the, the, which, which, which book? The Curse of Self. Yeah, no, I know. I don't think that I read that. I only read the Self-Illusion, I think. Oh, the so. Self-Illusion. Okay, Self-Illusion. Yes. All right, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the Bruce guy. Yeah, the Self-Illusion. Yeah. Yeah, Curse of Self. Yeah, so there's another book. I should probably read it. Maybe, I think, Arya, you've read The Curse of Self. Yes. Is, does that sound right? Is that what he's describing about in the book? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think in the book, he's also arguing that when we become too attached to ourselves, we become rigid, right? Um, have you ever found yourself being kind of rigid about something? I haven't. I, I haven't either, I think. <laughs> and do you want to talk a little bit, Aria, too, about like your own therapy experience? Like, like what your therapist says about you? Are you a good patient or a bad patient? Uh, I think my, my therapist probably looks forward to talking to me. I think that I have um, 
when we're speaking. Uh, very few kind of emotional uh, hiccups or breakdowns or anything like that. In fact, he, he says one of the things he admires about me most is that I'm, uh, I can find comedy and anything that we're talking about. Um, but you know, of course we talk about hard things. And one of those things was that, you know, I was so, uh, flexible with what anyone told me, you know, he told me once I could tell you that you are like, you know, schizophrenic and all these things that are not true about you. And you would probably just be like, okay, you know, and not kind of argue back with me. Like, no, there's no evidence that I am schizophrenic or fat or something like that. Um, but then over time, I started to get a little bit more rigid, uh, especially with what I perceived to be good and bad. So something, you know, lying was always bad, right? Stealing was always bad. And now I, because before I used to be like, well, you know, stealing sometimes is not that bad. And I lie a lot, but it really is for the greater good, right? <laughs> uh, but now I'm trying to become a little bit more flexible again, uh, with other people's faults, um, and the quote unquote bad things that they do. Yeah. It's interesting kind of like, um, you know, to what extent does like self and this, this is like all, <laughs> this is what we always end up talking about. Right. Elsa is because I thought it was so weird to go from like basically no sense of self to kind of having more a sense of self and like what changes about it, like what changes. And I do think like this kind of issue of compartmentalization is there, but kind of has like a different role. It's not like you suddenly stop compartmentalizing at all, because I think that, uh, I think that psychopaths in a way, but this kind of other definition that we've been using. And so let's talk a little bit about this other definition of compartmentalizing, which is this like non-trauma-based compartmentalization, but is really just like an efficiency-based, you know, your brain wants to make shortcuts. So you said if ARIA means compartmentalization more in a way of separating thoughts, etc., to increase the focus on one task, for instance, separating work and private life, I think that some people are better at that than others. I guess psychopaths would be very good at that because it's easy to put thoughts, etc., aside if you are not really emotionally invested in that. At least that's the case uh, for you, I think, but then I can't assume that's the case for everyone. And th does that sound kind of accurate to like what you do, like with work and your, your different style friends? Um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, why I wrote that. So I, I'm really good at that, like separating things and um, then just focus on, on something else, even though like, I don't know if I have like a lot of deadlines coming at me, I am very good at just focus on one and I do not like kind of panic because I have too many deadlines coming or whatever. So um, I think like a lot of people would be like stressed out by that, um, but I'm not. So I, I think, yeah, I can kind of deal with that pressure, but also if I have like arguments with people um, and then if I'm not around them anymore, then I can just put that aside and focus on other things. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. And with deadlines, I think a lot of people thought probably I was a, a creepy person in law school because I was like, well, you know, the first year of law school is kind of the most important. So I'm going to just kind of budget myself two hours a week of social time. <laughs> like they never saw me outside of class just because I was almost like a machine, you know, like let's just sit down and do this task and I don't need anything else or whatever. I think I think that uh, psychopaths tend to be a little bit better at that if they, you know, have kind of uh, uh, a self-awareness or maybe like an ability to kind of see that that's important. You know, like if you're able to see that law school is important, then you're able to do that, I think. Uh, but I think maybe some psychopaths kind of lack that ability to see that law school is important, stuff like that. Yeah. So, I think not only that, like also like, I don't know if you have like a deadline in one week, but then you also have like other things to do or you want to do other things. And then, uh, for example, I do not think about that deadline all the time and I can just like put that thought aside. But then I know from other people that they cannot concentrate or focus on anything else because they always have like this deadline in their head and think like, okay, I have to do that. So I think that, yeah, also this. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, too. I think that uh, for whatever reason, maybe because we're able to do that kind of hyper focus and then when we look away, then it's as if the thing does not exist, that we probably worry less about things, too. You know, maybe this gets us into trouble and it probably does 
you know, honestly, when we make decisions, you know, not properly kind of focused on or aware of the future implications of the decision, but also we, it's, it's way less stress, <laughs> you know, it's pretty stress free existence. I've all, always thought that psychopaths tend to be pretty carefree individuals. Yeah, and I think that helps you like to separate like then different thoughts, uh, yeah, in like daily life. Yeah. So here's what Arthur says, and then we'll kind of give some uh, uh, wrap up thoughts. Uh, so uh, he he's talking about the same thing, like this compartmentalization that's just, you know, your ability to be either focused on something or not focused on something or kind of keep parts of your life separate. And he says, why sociopaths? Well, we're also humans after all, even if we appear as logical thinking intelligent, uh, which is, of course, just part of the picture. Our brains are still more or less the same as normal people, and same mechanisms make us think this way. He said, I could invent some idea like we're more logical, rational, less emotional, which makes us better suited for conflicts, or that need for closure is an effect of evolution, nothing more rational than evolution. He's, his idea of closure is just kind of talking about like certainty. You know, that's why we compartmentalize, it's just to like kind of make things that seem uncertain and unknown uh, suddenly known and certain. And he says, and maybe we live and act as if we understood consciously or not, doesn't really matter, this evolutionary logic better. To be honest, though, about sociopaths, explanation, which seems better for me, is that most of us, especially sociopaths, experience kind of trauma. And it was important during childhood to be able to com compartmentalize. For example, many people experience violence are likely to use violence. So he's kind of saying, you know, like maybe the reason why we're kind of better about this is that uh, maybe it really does get back to kind of these defense mechanisms where, you know, as maybe even earlier than we remember, there was some sort of trauma or some sort of evolutionary efficiency-minded way that made this better for us. What do you think about that? Wait, I, did he mix, like, did, is he now talking about the compartmentalization in, like, the psychology term or, like, the more, like, uh, daily life focus um, separating thought thing? I think yeah, I think he's kind of saying maybe there is a connection, you know, maybe one is the same, you know, maybe there really is, like the reason why we're separating thought and daily life is in some ways, you know, uh, not, and not trauma in like this, like, oh, it's a defense mechanism way, but just like negative things have happened to us in life. You know, we didn't get that ice cream cone like we wanted. You know, that's not traumatic, but it's still like something that you've like responded to where you like in order... If you compartmentalize, you know, your feelings of disappointment about the not getting the ice cream cone, then maybe you live a happier life than other people do. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, um, I think this is like something like, uh, like an expert, like psychologist or someone who's an expert on that topic needs to answer because I have no idea. I, I don't know. I cannot say anything about that. Yeah. If it's connected or not. Oh, well, it's been good talking with you. Do you have any like wrap up thoughts or things that we didn't talk about you want to get to? Um, no. Do you? No. Aria, do you? No? Okay. Well, it was super interesting to talk about compartmentalization, its role with uh, rationalization in terms of resolving cognitive dissonance and the different ways, you know, possibly a different word should be invented to talk about this like thing that we do where we just separate our thoughts uh, maybe and kind of... Uh, a word for that. Maybe there's already a word for that. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, these, these separate identities that we don't, we don't necessarily feel the need to resolve like other normal people do. So anyways, thank you so much, and we will talk to you later.